Good morning. This is Steve from Southern Illinois. It's a breezy but cloudy day down here. We've been experiencing some rain again, so I haven't had to water my garden yet. And I got the first tomato, so Vivian is happy. Touchstones. By rubbing a piece of gold against a touchstone and comparing the color of the streak that it leaves to that of a standard, you can determine how pure the gold is. We've been examining what it takes to build a strong spiritual life through the lens of the lives of the people in the Bible. They are our touchstone. Each week we're looking at something different that they found strength in, and by rubbing our lives up against them, we can assess whether that strength is a part of our lives or a potential for growth. Last week's talk examined some of the questions surrounding the issue of prophecy in the Bible. And afterwards, one of my friends messaged me to share, share the value that he found in prophecy. And one of the sentences in his messages, message stood out to me. He said, prophecy to me reveals a God who is in control in what seems like a chaotic world. Chaos. That describes the world that I live in to a T. Having a God who is helping me to navigate that chaos, I can understand how that would be a strength. Today I want us to walk through the foundational prophecy, the prophecy that is at the center of all of the big P prophecy in the Bible. Now, I recognize that for those of you who are struggling with religion, all of this talk about prophecy can be quite a stretch. But take comfort in the fact that for many Christians, these conversations are a stretch as well. Many Christians have been taught that the Bible is divided into different sections that apply to different audiences. For many Christians, the fact that the passage we're going to be looking at today, the story that we're looking at today, is from the Old Testament rather than the New, means that they've been treating it as, just as irrelevant in their lives as you have been in yours. So I'm going to ask all of you whether you have embraced religion or are struggling with religion to set aside your intellectual struggles for a minute and just listen to the story as it unfolds. And then at the end you can decide whether this represents a spiritual strength for your life or not. The story I want us to to look at today is found in the book of Daniel. Uh, we're going to be talking about the content that's in the first three chapters. Daniel was a slave. He had started life and as a child he'd been in a sheltered environment, a religious environment. He'd been a bright, young, promising scholar. His future was rosy and then war came and he was stolen away from his family by force. He was neutered, that's right, neutered, just like a dog or a cat, and then forced to march hundreds of miles away from his home, completely separated from everyone he knew. And once there, he was forced into an educational system designed to strip away his identity, to strip away his connection with his culture, to completely replace his value system and his worldview with that of his captors. He experienced what many Americans have experienced in the past, and then some. Forced assimilation. 
Now, as a part of his education, he was taught dream interpretation. And it turned out he was good at it. His captors had accumulated over a thousand years of data comparing omens with events in the lives of kings and nations. Omens could be things in nature like floods or droughts, locust swarms, uh, things in the sky like storms or uh, solar eclipses or comets. And then, of course, there were dreams. All of these omens had been recorded, and along with them, the daily prices of commodities in the marketplace, the outcomes of battles, of illnesses, of rebellions. They had books and books and books full of lists of omens and the events they were associated with. This was Daniel's expertise. He had trained for it. He was good at it. But he was a slave, a foreigner. And so despite the fact that the Bible says that when he finished his education, he scored 10 times better than the experienced wise men. For years, he spent, spent his days in the lower echelon of the machinery, the advisory machinery for the king. He was a meaningless cog. Maybe he was carrying messages or copying texts. Until one day, the king called his chief advisors in. His sleep has been disrupted the night before with a disturbing dream. Now, that's a code word. In Babylonian culture, dreams were thought to come from three different sources. Clear dreams, the dreams that you wake up and you know exactly what, they, what, what happened and you can clearly recall them, came from the gods. They were messages, instructions, calls to action. Disturbing dreams, dreams that you wake up and you can remember them, but, oh, this is horrible. These were from the demigods down below. Yes, our whole concept of heaven above and hell beneath comes from the Mesopotamian worldview. The demigods down below could send dreams, and those dreams were curses. Unless you did something to counter that dream, that horror that you had dreamed about would come true in your life. And then there was this big category that they called confusing dreams. These dreams were neither clear nor were they disturbing. They were just weird. And these dreams were considered to come from the bubbling of the chaos that surrounded the order of the sphere that we live in. So, when the king said that he'd had a disturbing dream, he was communicating that there was a crisis. He had had a major omen of disaster. And to have a disturbing dream that he could not remember, that only accentuated the crisis. How can you counter a curse when you can't remember it? So he made an unusual request from his advisors. I had a disturbing dream. I cannot remember it. Tell me what my dream was and then how to counter it. And when they said, uh, King, that's impossible, he doubled down with an ultimatum. Give me an answer or I will cut you all in pieces. <laughs> LBJ, <clears throat> President Johnson, President Trump had nothing on this guy. 
He was a true monster, a dictator in the flesh. <laughs> now, we're going to fast forward through the story. Um, Daniel asks for a chance to answer the question because it turns out that the lower echelons in the advisory uh, uh, department are included in this death, death threat. Uh, and um, he asks for time to consult his god. He doesn't consult the books, he goes to his god. And the king thinks, ah, oh, this is a fresh approach. And so he gives him a day. And Daniel has the same dream that the king had. And the next morning he's brought before the king and the king says, well, can you do it? And Daniel says, no one can. But there's a God in heaven who can. And this is what you dreamed, King. You saw a statue made of various metals. Gold, silver, bronze, iron from top to bottom. And its feet were a mixture of iron and ceramics. Suddenly, a stone rose out of the ground and slammed into the statue and broke it into pieces and then ground it into dust and the dust blew away. Meanwhile, the stone started to grow and grow and grow until it filled the entire world. And in those days, okay, the king at this point uh, must have nodded or something because um, Daniel went on to the interpretation and if the king hadn't recognized the dream I don't think he would have gotten away with that. So Daniel proceeded to give the interpretation of the dream and when we compare this to the texts that were written on dream interpretation in Mesopotamia, uh, we find out that much of this is straight out of his training as a dream interpreter. You and your nation are the head of gold. God has given you this kingdom and the dominance you have in world affairs. But another nation will replace yours you would consider it inferior to yours. But that nation too will be replaced and a fourth nation will, will come on the scene. But after that, <clears throat> the world will descend into chaos. Nations will be fighting with each other. Some will be strong, some will be weak. But nobody will be able to gain any lasting dominance over the, over the whole. And in the days of all of that chaos, God, the God of heaven, will set up his own kingdom and he will destroy all of these other nations. His kingdom will last forever. God has answered the questions that you had while you were falling asleep, King. You were wondering what was going to happen to the future. You were wondering what was going to happen to your kingdom in the future after you had died. This is what the future holds. And the interpretation is, sent, is certain. Nothing will change it. How did Nebuchadnezzar react? Well, he rewarded Daniel profusely. Daniel had told him his dream and given an interpretation. But then he ignored Daniel's advice. He called in his advisory team, who he had just threatened to cut in pieces, and said, okay, Daniel has revealed the dream, so I'm not going to kill you, but what do I need to counter this dream? You see, this was still a disturbing dream. This was still a dream from the demigods. And the fact that Daniel had
gained access to it somehow and then interpreted did not change the fact that it was a disturbing dream. And so the, the king felt he had to take some action. Well, the answer of the wise men was, uh, well, that's another story, okay? Because the key thing I want us to focus on today is this dream. Because this dream, which was given to a pagan king, not a follower of God, a pagan king, and that was interpreted by a slave, a neutered slave, which in the Jewish economy meant he could never go to church. He was a spiritual outcast. He was a nobody. So this pagan king and this neutered slave have this dream and that is the central focus of all of the big P prophecy in the Bible. All of the rest of the big P prophecies in the Bible expound on, build upon, develop the themes of this dream and explain it. Now last week I asserted three things about prophecy. Prophecy provides strength because it teaches us that God knows the future. The future is not resting on our shoulders. And he knows the steps to get there. Okay, That burden is off of us as well. And it tells us, gives us certainty that in the future there is reason for hope. This week, I want to add a fourth element. God is actively working to bring that hope to reality. The message that I find here, uh, my friend verbalized very well. In his message to me, he went on to say, I've watched many people develop a faith in God when they discover what he has to say about world affairs and how he is not only engaged in them but is also working actively in a way to make things like they should be and were before the fall of mankind. In the end, he's got this. And that, my friends, sum up, sums up the strength that I find in this touchstone. We're not alone in working to end injustice, to right wrongs, to relieve suffering. There is a God who is actively working towards that end as well. And because of that, I am not led to despair when my efforts seem to fail. I don't have to resort to violence or deceit or manipulation. I don't have to rationalize that the end justifies the means. I can be at, the, at peace in the midst of any storm even when it means that I am suffering injustice or those that I love are suffering injustice. In the end, he's got this. Now, of course, all of this is only available to me because I've already accepted the previous touchstones. I've accepted the possibility of God, that he's personal and compassionate, that he communicates with us, that he loves me, like a real father, that he loves me so much that he was willing to do something that I find unthinkable, allow my own son to die to save someone else. He offers forgiveness freely, but does not abandon justice. So my challenge to you remains the same. 
Will you take a risk on God? I'm not talking to you because of my religious upbringing. I'm talking to you because despite my intellectual struggles, I took a, I took a chance on God and discovered that embracing the possibility of God and who He is brought a source of spiritual strength, imparted a depth of meaning, a certainty of purpose to my life that I couldn't find any place else. Will you join me? Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I hope to see you next week.